Mingalaba Kinba. My name is Hardik Gandhi and I represent Medical Affairs for Zydus. It is with great pleasure that I, on behalf of Zydus, welcome the esteemed chair, Professor Coco, the elite panel of speakers represented by Dr. Deepak Talwar, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, and Dr. Kevin, and the much revered audience to this Virafin launch symposium. Virafin or phagylated interferon alpha 2b is a product which revolutionizes management of COVID. For COVID, it is unanimously agreed that an intelligent and an early start is always better and improves prognosis. Today, we are launching an innovative treatment for early medical intervention in COVID and we have an elite panel of speakers who will share details about COVID management protocols, research behind Virafin, and the clinical trial data related to the same. So without further ado, let me now introduce the chair of today's meeting, Professor Coco. Professor Coco is a senior consultant endocrinologist from Yangon, is the head of the Department of Endocrine endocrinology at the North Okalapa General and Teaching Hospital, University of Medicine II, Yangon. He is also the Vice President of Myanmar Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism and General Secretary of the Myanmar Diabetes Association. Professor Koko, it is our great pleasure that you have agreed to chair this session and I now invite you to say a few words and open the scientific discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our symposium today. What's the management of the COVID? What's news? And thank you for your time. And because of the, in spite of the busy schedule, thank you for your times. And as you all know, we are facing with the third wave of the COVID-19 in Myanmar. And because of the, you know, limited human resources, and uh, our hospital cannot accommodate all the patients. So all the healthcare provider has to taking care of their parents, their relatives, and their patient in hospital as well as in their homes. So I would like to say thank you so much to all the healthcare provider who are treating and saving their patient life. And when we face in and management of the COVID-19, there are a lot of guidelines because uh, COVID-19 is a new disease. So we are, have uh, many dilemma in getting the decision for the management. So what we have to follow that guideline or this guideline. So there are a lot of dilemma as well. Every country has their own experience. So now we are very lucky today. We have an eminent speaker from the India who have, can share his experience in the COVID-19 management in India because the India has been facing before us. So um, for that reason, I would like to introduce and uh, Dr. Deepak Talwa. Uh, he is a senior consultant and chairman, Metro Respiratory Center, Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine, Metro Hospital and Heart Institute, NIDA, UP and India. He graduated in 1980. He has a lot of diploma, MD, DNB, and DM in the pulmonary medicine mainly. He has an awarded fellowship by College of the Chest Physician India and American College of Chest Physician USA as well. He has a paper of published paper of 55 local and 23 international paper has been published. He's a fellow of the chest physician, clinical care, critical care medicine, respiratory society, sleep medicine, allergy and immunology from India, USA, Europe, and the Asia as well. He's a principal investigator of the many trials, and he has been given more than 1,000 CMD lectures in all over the India and Asian Pacific region, mainly on the respiratory medicine. So it's my privilege to invite Dr. Dibal Dalwa for your presentation. What is management COVID-19 Indian prospectus? So Dr. Dibal, over to you. 
Thank you, Professor Coco. Good morning, everybody. I am at 11.30 as far as India time is concerned. And uh, thank you all my friends and colleagues in Myanmar. It's been, uh, I think I visited six years ago. That's all I can remember right now. But of course, this is a virtual meeting. And uh, in this pandemic times, I think uh, this is the best we could afford right now. Can I start sharing my slides? Yes, sir, please. So when it comes to COVID-19, I think all of us have been learning, experiencing, and daily getting updates on what to do and what not to do. I think Professor Coco was very right when he made a comment that every day a new guideline comes and from a new place it comes with a new recommendations and every trial when it is published, it uh, denounces whatever we have learned so far. So keeping pace with them has almost become so difficult that every day you not only need to scrutinize the data which is published, lot of which is actually not peer reviewed and you have to take your call on the basis of whatever is available to you and then utilize it in your daily practice of looking at the patients. If this kind of a situation exists, when you are seeing a couple of patients, then you have that much of time to go through the data, analyze the data, and then finally take a call on yourself and also keep your local guidelines in your mind. And I think what we have learned in COVID-19 is that every country, every state, like India, I think we have got 22 states with different guidelines. So there, there are national guidelines. There are national guidelines from two places. There are state guidelines. There are so many of them. We are flooded with them. And all of them keep conflicting, keep updating themselves. And then it becomes very difficult to see what's happening if you are hit by a tsunami of patients as it happened with second wave to India between April and month, uh, May, two months, when there were so many patients that I think it was almost impossible to keep a count of what is going on. So this disease, the important aspect which we need to remember is that uh, who are the patients who are going to be at high risk for death, mortality, worsening respiratory failure? Because we know that the 90% of the patients of COVID-19 will be able to get through this disease without getting any significant harm. But this 10% of patients who will get into the hospitals and will be the ones who are at high risk for death, we need to identify them, handpick them from the community and actually accelerate their admissions into the hospital. And many a times we need to even prioritize that. It becomes very difficult to do it in daily practice, but that's exactly what we need to do. So if you look at the data, the data itself is very clear here that you have people who are elderly, people who are men, people who have got lymphopenia at the first time when these symptoms are onset and you do the blood tests and progressive lymphopenia. And very importantly, those patients who have got chronic comorbidities related to heart, diabetes mellitus, chronic lung, kidney or liver diseases, the brain diseases like cerebrovascular disease and very important obesity. Obesity, diabetes, elderly men more than 60 years of age with any other morbidity are most likely candidates who are going to suffer and we need to actually segregate them, identify them early for a fast track care which will be required because they will take no time to deteriorate. These patients need to be kept on a very close observation. Why I brought this point is that uh, I, 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 as Professor Coco also said in the beginning itself, when he was talking about it, that there was no beds available. We have to take care of a lot of patients at home and manage them, although they needed admission. And then again, pick and choose those who are the worst ones to be sent or those who are likely to get worse in the coming uh, few hours to days to fast track them to get admissions into the hospital. The beds were really very, very scarce. So we have a huge number of drugs which have been tried and we all know that in COVID-19, when it struck, there was no time 
to for us to do the research to get the new drugs for it so all our repurposed drugs which have been previously used for either viral infections or for immunomodulation to tone down the cytokines or immunosuppressives to look and work at the level of uh, the inflammation which is going on in the lungs particularly and elsewhere too so we worked on antivirals with the with the within mind that covid-19 is a coronavirus and various antivirals have been tried and initially in the last uh, wave that was the first wave actually when it struck india we had nothing but lopinavir ritonavir ocitlabmavir were primarily the antivirals which were used and then at the time when the sec first wave was still going on feviperavir was launched and it was used extensively and also convalescent plasma because we we realized that the antivirals which are available to us are not very strong antivirals and they are not true antivirals for coronaviruses they have some effect but not to the effect what we want in these patients because despite them patient continues to deteriorate hydroxychloroquine azithromycin doxycycline have been all used not only for their antimicrobial use but also for the salutary effects of being anti inflammatory drugs towards the end of the first wave we started getting the reports of remdesivir trial and then remdesivir became into the main work for all the patients who were admitted with moderate to severe covid in the hospitals other antivirals like nitoxanide ribavirin were, were found to be of no use interferon is the one which is being presently used and this is after the time when we got the first wave over the 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 interferon theory started working in and we got drugs to use that so all all these drugs which are mentioned in antivirals they have been tried in the first wave and then going on into the second wave and what we are left with at the moment is feviperavir remdesivir which are both antivirals but we know that they were none of them was actually meant for coronaviruses coming to immunosuppressives the one trial which came with the, the with the recovery trial we got the data on dexamethasone and then there were we were flooded with other studies showing that any other steroid also has some effect or this good effects of dexamethasone and then methylprednisolone and prednisolone were also there and they were all basically used as immunosuppressives to take care of the inflammation going on in the uh, coronavirus and then finally the there's a lot of cytokines which come into play in coronavirus required to use anti cytokine drugs and they are immunomodulators il1 il6 and and some of them which has been extensively used is the il6 inhibitor that is tocilizumab and then we also have now the jack inhibitors and stat inhibitors which are like bercitinib and tofacitinib so our basket of repurposed drugs to use in coronavirus has been expanding every day with a new drug also showing some effect in small little trials comprising 100 to 150 patients i don't think so the physicians across the world would have ever faced this kind of a plight that on the basis of a trial conducted on 150 patients we need to use the drug on thousands and thousands and perhaps millions of patients but there was no way out because there was no time to test get the results because any drug from development to final clinical use requires minimum of 5 to 10 years of the period where the research has to go in and thousands of patients have to be tried before an answer can be given yes or no but this was peculiar times this was the time when we had to take a call on the basis of these small studies and on the top of it we were troubled by the contradictory studies which kept on coming every other day and then big trials sponsored by who that also came into play to change our tactics how to manage it but i what i am going to talk about today is that by far what has stood the test of time and the drugs which are really the ones irrespective of the conflict still going on are being used by all practitioners in india in unanimous fashion so as we all know that these drugs need to be 
put at the proper appropriate time on the in the time cycle of corona infection when you have a viral phase in which you have symptoms like fever cough myalgia and some dyspnea you use antivirals but once the inflammatory stage set in the pneumonia occurs you have hypoxia respiratory failure fever and hypotension where you have a role for immunosuppressors immuno uh, immunos uh, the ones which targets the inflammation like steroids and once it is not getting response with these kind of drugs we start working on the cytokines and anti cytokine drugs because another feature after this is the where the cytokine storm comes with a lots of cytokines and inflammatory markers circulating into the system where you need to stem the tide of cytokines by using anti cytokine drugs which are mostly the immunomodulators anti il6 being the most commonly used there some of the patients continue to progress and develop ards sepsis septic shock and stay on ventilators for long time many of them don't make it and those who make it they make it with subsequent damage to the lungs in the, the recovery so most of the damage in the recovery phase what we these days call as post acute uh, covid syndrome or long covid after 3 months are the patients who suffered from severe covid or moderately severe covid and uh, required high oxygenation during their care for the acute covid covid treatment now this optimal timing has been primarily being uh, shifted a little bit basically depending upon how long you get the virus and when does the cytokines come and when do they storm us and all these things are based on the studies which were initially done at wuhan and their data is replicated to almost across the world so first 7 to 10 days of viral replication then 7 to 14 days for the inflammatory phase and after the 14 days we have a cytokine phase and after 21 days it's recovery which starts mostly after 4 day 4 weeks most of the patients uh, go for the recovery except for those who are stuck on to the ventilators in ards sepsis and septic shock these effects of these drugs have been primarily to make the outcomes better and that is what has been debated in the trial after trial because the trials have been going both ways either positive or negative depending upon the selection criteria of the patient and the timing at which the drug was introduced so i think the whole crux of therapy of covid-19 is on not only on the drugs but also on the timing at which the drug is introduced we have been dividing them into mild moderate and severe and india has the same as the who and the only difference is we don't have a critical uh, covid here because all severe covid gets admitted into the intensive care moderate into the wards and mild are treated at home but very rightly that when we were overwhelmed in the second wave there was no beds available lot of them with the moderate covid required to be treated at home and that is a very big challenge because the drugs which are in and injectables to be given to them in the moderate covid to give them at home is almost next to impossible so if we look at the covid from the mild covid perspective that when we treat them at home there is some difference between wave 1 and wave 2 and there is going to be a difference when we hit wave 3 again we started with azithromycin and uh, ivermectin moved on to doxycycline and hydroxychloroquine and then all permutation and combinations of these two drugs azithromycin and ivermectin for immunomodulation or immunostimulatory properties and primarily azithromycin and doxycycline for antimicrobial and anti inflammatory effect after the covid wave first wave we did realize that something like azithromycin is of no use doxycycline is of no use and unless and until you have super added bacterial infection which occurs only in 10% of patients who are admitted in the hospital with covid-19 you don't need them and in the patients being treated at home there is hardly any role of using antibiotics we moved on to ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin although both have been shown to have the data which is not encouraging at all at the moment is still being used to treat second wave and aftermath of second wave in india 
So every physician is still happy to use ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and very importantly, in the mild COVID, what has come into this second wave is inhaled butosonide. On the basis of one trial, which has been published, a UK trial on Lancet, that we give 800 micrograms twice a day, which decreases symptoms and uh, leads to early defervescence of fever in this group of patients. Coming to ivermectin, which is perhaps the most debated thing at the moment, is that uh, we know it inhibits replication of many viruses. It has anti-inflammatory properties, and it also leads to inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 to binding of the host tissue via, via various possible mechanisms which has been postulated for it. It has been shown to inhibit the cytokine production and transcription of nuclear factor kappa B, which is the most potent mediator of inflammation. So anti-inflammatory as well as an immunomodulator drug like this. What has gone wrong with ivermectin is primarily looking at the data which has been obtained from 24 clinical trials. If we look at the meta-analysis, all but two trials were negative. So you can imagine 22 trials supporting ivermectin, but two well-conducted controlled player trials showing no effect of it. So although we know that in the clinical experience that in mild cases, it did prevent transmission and development of COVID-19 disease in some, hastens the recovery in some of the patients. Even the avoidance of getting hospitalization is also reduced. And uh, in some studies, it even led to decrease in case fatality rates. But of course, we have the newer studies which are still pouring in. And if you see this month's JAMA, the ivermectin study is again negative, azithromycin study is still negative. But by and large, ivermectin still continues to be used in India for the mild disease, almost in all patients who are being treated at home. The second drug which has been used for mild uh, COVID-19 is an antiviral drug. And this was launched about a year ago in India. And this is Feviperavir. We all know it is a Japanese drug which was primarily used to treat influenza. But the dose required in uh, COVID-19 was very high in comparison to what was required in influenza. It has shown in vitro antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 in human cells. And in the studies, it did show that if it is used in early cases or as soon as the symptom onset occurs, it leads to attenuation of the symptoms by reducing the duration of fever, cough, and brings early defervescence in the patients with mild COVID and hence a large number of patients. In fact, if I give you the number, it is almost 7 million patients in India have been treated with feviperavir in this second wave. So the number of drug which has been sold, according to it, it is estimated that 7 lakh people in India used feviperavir in mild to moderate cases because when moderate cases were treated at home, the only antiviral which was available to them was a feviperavir which was used. Again, the data of feviperavir is also not so brilliant where it can be recommended in all mild to moderate cases. And if we look at the data, perhaps the, uh, the, some of the guidelines do not recommend it. And in even in Indian guideline, some of the states do recommend it, some of the states don't recommend it. What feviperavir does it, it inhibits the RNA dependent uh, RNA polymerase and uh, from there, it seems that it should have a viral uh, antiviral effect. I think the most important thing for physicians at this moment of time is to balance between the science, the evidence and the logic. All three, if they have to use in an individual patient when they are treating and they are bombarded with the guidelines which are conflicting almost every month and from state to state and from country to country and from international societies, it becomes almost impossible to take a call. But I'm giving you this call that this drug has been used, although despite the pill burden and uh, the number of days it needs to be used is like 14 days, 800 milligram twice a day from second day, 1800 milligram twice a day on the day one. 
uh, it has been widely and across the India it has been used. The only contraindications are extreme hyperuricemia, severe hepatic and renal impairment, pregnant and lactating women. It can be used in elderly and it has been used in elderly also. I think the only drawback which we felt in clinical practice in using Feviparaways was one, that it has a huge pill burden. Second, it needs to be used for 14 days. So in first wave, we found most of the patients were leaving their drug after seven to eight days when they were asymptomatic, their fever went away and they started feeling better and then they were all right. But in second wave, these patients, when they stopped the drug earlier, in fact, there was a time when hypoxia set in, they went on to develop moderate COVID and sometimes later on to develop the cytokine storm. So the difference between use of feviparavir in wave one and wave two in India has been more extended or full extended 14 day use of feviparavir in wave two vis a vis wave one. Hydroxychloroquine, as I said, that recovery and solidarity trials showed no benefit of hydroxychloroquine. But primarily, Indian guidelines did recommend hydroxychloroquine for almost one and a half year to continue to use in mild COVID. And it was primarily on the Belgian study, which used low dose hydroxychloroquine, that is 2,400 milligrams spread over five days, which did show a reduction in death in those patients who received hydroxychloroquine to 17.7% vis-a-vis a group which did not receive hydroxychloroquine, which was 27.1%. So almost 10% absolute difference in mortality rates in patients on hydroxychloroquine versus not hydroxychloroquine. Similar study from France also uh, did not show actually the benefit, but in fact, it was on the contrary showed that those patients who received hydroxychloroquine were at a higher risk for mortality and transfer to the intensive care unit. But the dose which was used in solidarity trial and recovery trials was 9,600 milligram because they gave it for 10 days. So our guidelines in India, ICMR recommended to use 2,800 milligram over five days, which had shown benefit in Belgian study, provided patient doesn't have any uh, uh, contraindication to use hydroxychloroquine. This is the first time where the so many ECGs were done prior to using hydroxychloroquine to look at the QTC. And if the QT interval is more than 4, 480, they are not given. If they have any history of cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrhythmias, retinopathy, hypersensitivity, G6 PD deficiency, epilepsy or hypokalemia, again, the hydroxychloroquine was withheld in this group of patients. And they were put on ivermectin. Then coming to inhaled budesonide. So this is the STOIC trial, which was published, as I said, in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. And since it came around December, so from January this year, the, the COVID-19 practice and mild COVID changed completely with this trial, where it showed that even one week of uh, 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 using inhaled budesonide, 800 micrograms twice a day, did lead to earlier recovery lesser urgent care requirement or going to er assessments for hospitalization these of these patients and also cough and fever settled uh, two two days earlier in compare comparison to the group which did not receive buracinite so since it is innocuous drug it is a drug which has potential no harm can be easily given to the patients only thing was how to teach them how to use pmdis and of course, lots of them were given spacers or dry powder inhaler or even nebulized butosinide. And this was a drug which was immensely used to treat home uh, treated COVID-19 patients along with ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine and feviparavir was the one which was op option, uh, which was very frequently chosen by the physicians in India because lots of states have a clear uh, mandate to use feviparavir while some of them did not make any comment on use of feviparavir. Just at the end of the second epidemic, actually, I think second wave when we were going through and we were so badly hit that we wanted to treat a lot of patients at home, we got permission to use the antibody cocktails where we have a casirvimib and imadimib brought to India. 
the only drawback of this uh, antibody cocktail was that it was available in 1200 plus 1200 milligrams so if you use that you have to use it together for two patients because the one set of vials was good enough for two patients so you need to identify two patients together to give one uh, to each of them then the cost is almost less 50 percent otherwise the patient has to bear a huge cost of this antibody cocktail so this two antibodies imadivib and casivermib they act on the different uh, you know, binding proteins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and together has been shown to be very efficacious to the tune of 70% reduction in uh, admission as well as uh, 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 admission and uh, COVID-19 related hospitalization and deaths in patients who are at high risk and they are picked up early in mild disease. So the important point is that at the time when we were actually exiting from the second wave, I do not know whether we have exited completely or not. In some places where it was already, you know, where lesser and lesser number of patients were coming, we have this uh, availability of uh, antibody cocktail and it was used primarily to target to keep the patients at home, particularly those patients who have mild disease, but at our high risk for deterioration and requiring hospitalization. So these were the patients who were elderly, more than 60 years, obese with cardiovascular diseases, comorbidities like chronic lung disease, diabetes, kidney liver disease, and those patients who were on uh, considered as immunosuppressed. So this uh, was primarily not used for hospitalized patients. It was used for uh, uh, patients. Uh, it was not used for those patients who were on oxygen. So. When it came, it was also used for patients with high risk, with moderate COVID, who were uh, who are yet not on oxygen dependent, and uh, it, there was a scare of these patients going ahead into further deterioration. So even in the hospital, this antibody cocktail did make a entry, but mostly looking at these group of patients. And now we have a recent trial which did show that. Uh, on the other uh, members of the family who have got exposed to COVID-19 because one patient getting affected, if they are given this cocktail, it significantly reduces their chances of developing COVID-19. So prophylactic role of this uh, antibody cocktail has been recently published. And this has been tried in some patients, especially with the Delta virus, where we know that if one member of the family gets COVID-19, within three days, almost the entire family will get affected. And if there are elderly members with so many significant comorbidities, it is uh, being given to as a profile access to prevent them from getting uh, symptoms of COVID-19. Remdesivir in COVID-19. This is again one of the most hot and debatable drug which has been used and uh, it was given a us fda emergency authorization because it is a drug which is uh, uh, primarily inhibits sars cov2 rna polymerase and it has been shown to uh, uh, affect particularly patients who are hospitalized with severe disease and for that the severe disease was those who were requiring oxygen with their saturation levels on room air being equal to or less than 94 percent also indicated on patients who are on respiratory support, NIV, mechanical ventilation, uh, um, uh, high frequency uh, nasal, uh, uh, nasal uh, oxygenation and even ECMOs. So uh, practically all patients who get admitted into the hospital became the candidates of remdesivir, but remdesivir was available in such a short supply that it could again be given to only those patients who were more sick and perhaps more having severe COVID disease where they were being given to them. The trials did show that more is the sickness level of the patients, better are the outcomes of remdesivir versus placebo in showing this Kepler-Mayer curves where the survival was better for those patients who were into the intermediate group of severities like those are, are severe but not critical but the drug is being primarily used for all patients from moderate severe and critical so long as the other criteria for using remdesivir are met so the only only thing which we need to see is that uh, they should not have liver enzymes more than five times of upper limit of normal their egfr should be not less than 30 so it should be more than 30 and uh, pregnancy or lactating females have not been advised to take remdesivir but i am telling you from indian experience 
with a due uh, consent from the pregnant and lactating mothers remdesivir has been already given successfully to lots of uh, pregnant and lactating mothers also in children it has not been used in less than 12 years and of course uh, it has been given primarily for 5 to 10 days initially in the first wave it was given for 10 days for this time we are giving it for 5 days and perhaps only given for a longer period for patients who are on mechanical ventilation or NIV support. Most of the patients get it for five days only. And the, the important point in remdesivir is that it has to be given within the 10 days of symptom onset. Most of the times it was not very clearly visible the day of onset of symptoms for most of the patients. It was difficult to take a history. So the physicians tried to stretch it up to 14 days. So if the patient is getting admitted within 10 days, they were given remdesivir. But if they were stretched between 10 to 14 days, it was a physician discretion whether to use remdesivir or not. And I can only tell you that most of the times, if it was available, the balance was tilted towards using it rather than avoid using it as far as uh, remdesivir is concerned. The recent data on remdesivir, particularly from WHO, showed that it makes no effect and there was a lot of hue and cry made in India also not to use remdesivir. But then I don't think so. It made any difference. The only thing was that remdesivir was not used frequently at home or small hospitals, but most of the times remdesivir was used for moderate to severe COVID in hospitalized patients. Then comes the steroids. The systemic steroids, there was data for methylprednisolone that it can be used for moderate to severe disease where uh, it is given for three days, particularly on the patients who have got bilateral pulmonary infiltrates on the X-ray or CT scans, and they are dependent on the oxygen. And it did show that uh, it had some, some numerical benefit on reducing the mortality as well as escalation of more care towards the ICU and need for mechanical ventilation. Primarily, the data which came in support of corticosteroids was the recovery trial, which is the dexamethasone trial. And uh, we all know that in that trial, the dose used was 6 milligram per day. A lot of patients were on ventilator, 35%, and 20% were receiving oxygen. And uh, the data showed that uh, DEXA had uh, no benefit on the group of patients who were on resp not respiratory support. So those patients who were not oxygen were not benefited. And very importantly, it was found to be more effective once it is started in the second week of illness rather than early. So I think what made of this, uh, this drug, which is perhaps the only drug which has shown to be effective in management in the inflammatory phase of COVID-19 was not to give when they are not requiring oxygen, they are maintaining their saturation above 94. It was not to be given 94 and above. And very importantly, to be not given very early within three to four days of symptom onset, unless and until there is a clear need where the physician understands the uh, the side effects of using uh, um, steroids in the early phase. And this is also very logical because the initial phase is a viral replication phase. And if you give steroids at the, that point, it will lead to prolonged viral phase as well as prolonged viral shedding, which both you do not want in COVID-19. So I think uh, this was a very important aspect which came out of uh, this study. And then subsequent studies also did show uh, the benefits of uh, steroids. So steroids became the mainstay of therapy for moderate to severe COVID. But as I said that it was very clearly reminded to everyone that please don't use it in early and mild diseases where it may do more harm than good. So appropriate time to use steroids is something which needs to be understood by everybody. And of course, a lot of... Uh, Misuse has also happened of steroids because of the because of the problem of not being able to see the patients, not being available to the patients 24 into 7. So anticipating that there is some fall happening, the steroids were given. Lots of physicians um, made patients walk and look at their saturations. And if they were dipping to 93, 94, they were started with steroids at home. So that was the kind of thing which uh, uh, which was learned in uh, wave two that rather than waiting, they started uh, demonstrating ex exertional uh, hypoxia 
and institute steroids early. But this early was only after the first seven days of viremic phase have gone. Another drug which was uh, which has been used extensively in hospitalized patients after the we learned from the first wave that uh, COVID pathology showed a lot of thrombotic microangiopathy and it is a disease of the vasculature due to lots of clots in the lungs is the use of anticoagulants. So anticoagulants have been used again in all the patients who were hospitalized and low molecular weight heparin has been used. In moderate patients, it has been given uh, 0.5 uh, unit, uh, 0.5 milligram per kilogram body weight once a day. And for severe COVID and critical COVID patients, it was given the same dose twice a day. Uh, but very importantly, it is not recommended for the patients at home with a very mild disease. But again, as I said that we had to treat moderate patients at home. So anticoagulants did reach homes also. And uh, when the injectables like low molecular weight heparin was not possible to be given, then oral anticoagulants were used and NOAX were the ones which were most frequently used. So we have uh, used uh, Apexiban, we have used uh, Rivroxiban and we have used uh, Debigatrin, all of them in prophylactic usages to treat moderate COVID at home. Although it was not uh, recommended, but it had to be used because these patients were exactly the patients who should have been admitted and treated into the hospitals. Post-discharge from the hospital, the anticoagulants were continued up to three weeks in most of the patients unless and until there was a contraindication. And those patients in whom it was to be continued before three weeks, it was primarily because they had a thrombotic event which was already diagnosed in the form of either DVT or pulmonary embolism or even digital uh, emboli. So, the, the, not the dexamethasone 6 milligram per day was uh, the, the, the uh, recovery trial, but we also used a lot of methylprednisolone. The dose has been 0.5 to 1 milligram in two divided dosages in moderate to severe COVID. In severe to very severe COVID, the dose has been 1 milligram to 2 milligram per kilogram. Since this was also in the ICMR guidelines, so it can be said that it was a higher dose than used for dexamethasol trial. But then obviously we had very sick patients where we had used this on the basis of some little studies and the, our uh, uh, ICMR had also recommended to use it. And if the patients are fit to use it orally, it was switched to oral, otherwise it was given intravenously. When we were using anticoagulants, we were very careful to see that there is no contraindication or high risk for bleeding for these patients because some of these patients did come up with a frank pulmonary hemorrhage or bleeding through the, uh, uh, through the uh, urine or having a bleeding PR. So those all kind of uh, complications of uh, uh, using anticoagulants has to be kept in mind. But uh, by and large, we, we, we are giving a lot of anticoagulants as well as steroids almost to hospitalized patients. Supportive care for patients with severe COVID, critical COVID, those patients who were in severe shock, septic shock, they were all treated on the lines of guidelines of septic shock, sepsis and uh, ARDS. No difference as far as the management of COVID related ARDS or sepsis or septic shock versus non-COVID related. Convalescent plasma, which was uh, a lot used in the in the uh, first wave, continued to be used in the initial part of the second wave. And then uh, our guidelines said that it is making no effect and it should not be used. The important difference was perhaps because we did not check the neutralizing antibody titers in the donor plasma, which is a must. And unless and until you have a titer of more than one is to 640, the plasmas which are given are of no use. Generally, two units have been given to the patient. Patient needs to be monitored. And of course, uh, for any anaphylaxis or any transfusion related infections. But by and large, we found that uh, this didn't have a very significant effect. And uh, at the time when we started getting monoclonal antibodies, I think that make a lot of difference because you are anyways giving antibodies into, to these patients rather than convalescent plasma. Finally, those patients who continue to be hypoxic despite being given remdesivir and steroids and anticoagulants, these patients were evaluated for inflammatory markers and if their inflammatory markers remained high, particularly IL-6, anti-IL-6 tocilizumab was being given. We know that tocilizumab is a, is a drug which is uh, primarily inhibiting uh, interleukin-2, interleukin-7 and granulocytes colony stimulating factor and many interferons as well as tumor necrosis factor alpha. 
So this is a very strong immunosuppressant drug. We used it in the first wave and learned that we had these patients in the post-hospitalization period with the couple of infections. And that was the dreaded side effect of using tocilizumab. But in this wave, again, the tocilizumab, uh, which uh, obviously on the basis of this trial, which it showed that uh, it did have uh, 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 the, the mortality benefit in the group of patients which were selectively chosen, highly dependent on oxygen, not responding on uh, steroids and uh, remdesivir, were benefited by it. But then uh, the further trials did not uh, prove its benefit. And in fact, uh, the phase three trials of Actrima did show that it has uh, the the primary endpoint was not met. However, there were secondary endpoints which were showing positive trend, and on the basis of that, this drug continued to be used in phase uh, in wave two also. And our guidelines also recommend it if the patient continues to have high CRPs and uh, high inflammatory markers despite being on steroids as well as remdesivir then the uh, one dose of tocilizumab is given. Lots of us have used two dosages also over a period of 12 hours. But uh, the important thing is that uh, you, you need to uh, document that these patients are not having serious underlying bacterial or tubercular infections, which sometimes uh, is there in our patients and it needs to be uh, taken care of before giving tocilizumab. Now, in the post-COVID, we are seeing patients who have received tocilizumab are coming with fungal infections as well as tuberculosis infections because it was perhaps not possible to screen all the patients so well or the histories were not so forthcoming to study that and even the CT scans were not available for all these patients to look for old tuberculous lesions or the lesions which could ultimately develop fungal infections. So tocilizumab has uh, again been one of the drugs which had a lot of problems because it was not available most of the times and its prices had uh, gone in India to almost about 2.5 lakh per vial. So it was a very, very expensive drug. Even I, I remember some of the people had spent 5 lakh rupees to buy a vial of tocilizumab. Generally, we gave it only when the IL-6 levels were about 50 to 100 fold high. They were worsening inflammatory markers. Patients were showing uh, deterioration in their hypoxic levels. And uh, we tried to look at it. The, at least the procalcitonin was negative. They were not extremely neutrophilic. They didn't have significant hepatic or renal involvement in them. And then in this second wave, we have one more drug and that was barcitinib and these are jack 1 2 inhibitors and where we know that where uh, the the ace 2 inhibitors are uh, sars 2 uh, sars cov 2 attaches to ace 2 inhibitors is taken inside the cell where there is a transcription and translation and replication of the virus which can be inhibited by remdesivir and then the assembly of this new virus and their release into the circulation can be inhibited by jack start inhibitors and one of them is barcitinib so this barcitinib has been shown to exhibit anti-inflammatory properties by suppressing cytokine signal, signaling through JAK1-2 inhibition. So we have two types of this uh, available. Both of them were available, barcitinib as well as tufacitinib. But when people started using it, it also went into shortage. And we know barcitinib has got a high specificity uh, for JAK2 inhibitor which is particularly involved in reducing the, uh, uh, in fact, is a, got an anti-cytokine effect where it reduces the release of cytokines. It is given orally in the dose of 4 milligram per day and it is generally given for about 14 days. On the other hand, tofacitinib is given 10 milligram twice a day and for the same period, but because it doesn't have specificity for JAK2, it is less effective than uh, barcitinib. So when it was not available, then obviously the tofacitinib was also used. The baricitinib in ACT2 trials as well as co-barrier trials did show that uh, when it is used as an adjunct therapy with remdesivir or corticosteroids or all the two together, then it has shown to be of benefit in high-risk group patients who are diabetic as well as hypertensive. And uh, this is a strategy which was initially thought to be for use of patients in whom you cannot use corticosteroids. They are contraindicated. So anti-inflammatory effects of barcitinib were to be utilized along with remdesivir. So that's why the initial trial was without corticosteroid because at that time recovery trial was not there. But then later on, the co-barrier trial did show that uh, 
when it is combined with dexamethasone and remdesivir then also bercetinib can be used and it is in fact used in place of uh, tocilizumab at the moment if you look at the nih guidelines it recommends to use it with dexamethasone alone or dexamethasone plus remdesivir or when dexamethasone cannot be used so bercetinib has been come into recommendations of nih also and it is also there in itsa guidelines also the as as i said that bercetinib also had the same uh, same issue that it is a it is a very strong immunosuppressant drug you need to watch out for infections in this group of patients so with all these drugs available to us the only thing what we need is to time them as far as the illness of uh, various phases of covid-19 are concerned so once the patient has early symptoms we have monoclonal antibodies for high risk patients otherwise we have feviparavir and we have ivermectin hydroxychloroquine and also interferons which will be discussed by the subsequent speakers a lot of zinc vitamin c vitamin d and calcium has been all used but uh, their roles have been always uh, difficult to define but since these are nutritional supplements they have been used but now we are seeing a lot of vitamin d hyper vitaminosis d because of excessive use of vitamin d by the patients at home prior to getting covid during covid and even after covid they continue to use it without even checking their vitamin d levels vitamin c is easy because water soluble even if it's in excess the kidney will get rid of it but zinc is again one of the potential thing which is being studied at the moment because it's a heavy metal might lead to a damage so after the patient is uh, not into the early phase or mild phase and requires hospitalization remdesivir dexamethasone or other steroids are there for use and of course we have a uh, bercetinib as well as tocilizumab to be used in this group of patients who continue to show deterioration despite using dexamethasone and remdesivir the other thing which is important in this group of patients is convalescent plasma but as i told you that because of no good quality of plasma in the used in clinical trials it is not being used at the moment with that i think i have come to a end of this presentation where it is the most important thing is not only the drugs but also to keep up them at the appropriate time of illness regard regarding each and every patient Thank you, Dr. Deepak Dawa, for your clear presentation and pros and cons of the using the all the antiviral, immunological, and the uh, immunomodulator drugs. So we learn a lot from you as well. There will be a lot of questions, I think, uh, for you. And then later on, to, because of the you know, uh, we will move to the next speakers. Because there are a lot of innovation in the management of the management of the uh, COVID-19, or oh, there will be one innovation from the Cytos Cadillac company that will be the inter uh, peculated interferon brain. So we would like to learn from the one of these eminent speakers, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, Sanjay Kumar. He's a president and biologic research and manufacturing cider branch from Admiralty, Gujarat, India, and he will be talking to us for science beyond the, the rules of paraffin, peclated interferon alpha to be for COVID-19. So, Dr. Sanjay, Sanjay Kumar, please. Thank you, Professor Coco. Uh, if I can have the slides projected, please. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, after a great talk from Dr. Talwar on uh, the entire spectrum of COVID disease and how to manage it, uh, we will now come to uh, our molecule um, that we are discussing today. Virafin is the brand name. The molecule is pegylated interferon alpha 2b. And many of you or most of you would be familiar with this molecule. Uh, with its long history with uh, the treatment of hepatitis C. And you would you might also remember that 
interferon alpha, the plain interferon alpha 2b when it was developed for hepatitis B first did not really work very well in hepatitis C. And it is only when a PEG molecule was attached to interferon alpha 2b, increasing its molecular weight so that it could re remain in circulation uh, for a period of week or so at, at, at a therapeutic level, that when you are able to provide that kind of a therapeutic uh, dose to the patient, maintain that dose in the blood of the patient, that hepatitis C suddenly became a manageable disease. And prior to that, it was not so much so. So um, Dr. Talwar also mentioned to you that because drug development time was squeezed down from 10 years to maybe one year, uh, all the drugs which are out there are repurposed drugs. So this drug also we had developed for the treatment of hepatitis C and some cancers and had been with us for some time. And when COVID came, we tested this drug uh, for neutralization of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and of course, we I'll be showing you some data to that effect today. And also a lot of literature uh, was being published for the role of interferon, type 1 interferons in general, and interferon alpha in a more specific manner, showing that this was perhaps an important molecule in the, in the COVID disease and its management. Next slide, please. Oh, I will do it. Yeah, sorry. So, um, in all viral infections, or I should say most viral infections, the first line of defense that um, a human or an animal body puts forward is the secretion of uh, interferons, a type 1 interferons more specifically. Now, type 1 interferons constitutes a basket of a number of molecules, around 14 different molecules, uh, interferon alpha, interferon beta, interferon om uh, uh, omega, and, and within uh, interferon alpha, you have interferon alpha 2A, 2B, and very similar molecules, all of which are produced in response to a cell getting infected with a virus. And as soon as the cell gets infected with the virus, and if the virus is, um, you know, an RNA virus, for example, the, the cell recognizes that as a specific threat. And in, re in response to that threat, secretes interferon alpha, which goes out and binds to other neighboring cells around it, so that when the virus um, comes out again of the in first infected cell, that it, the, the neighboring cells are already ready and they, they shut down their protein synthesis machinery so that either the virus is unable to infect or even if it is able to infect, the machinery has been shut down. There is no more viral replication possible, no more synthesis of its envelope, etc. And therefore, in a localized manner, the infection gets taken care of. That's the primary mechanism of interferon alpha in the form of innate immunity. Now, interferons, because they have evolved uh, for a number of years along with, along with viruses, um, and because they are the first line of defense, somehow the mechanisms of interferon alpha also get intertwined with the generation of adaptive immunity so that if, if, if a patient um, is given or produces interferon alpha along with his or her infection, the adaptive immune response also gets helped. Uh, antigen presentation is better, right kind of cytokines are produced and your long lasting immunity takes place. Next slide, please. What is interesting though, is that while uh, Res most respiratory viruses induce interferon alphas or type 1 interferons. Interestingly, COVID-19 um, does not in do a, a good job of doing that. So this important paper came out in Cell um, in the year 2020 from Blanco Mello's group. And what um, it shows is a comparison of sera samples of 24 COVID-19 patients with those of 24 um, negative controls. And compared, if you look at the left panel, interferon beta is circled, that COVID-19 patients actually did not produce any type 1 interferon alpha. Specifically tested here is interferon beta, so we can talk about interferon beta only. But uh, 
this is indicative of the fact that even though there has been a viral infection, an RNA virus, uh, a respiratory infection, and therefore a type 1 interferons alpha, uh, type 1 interferons should have been produced. What we're seeing is actually the levels are undetectable and, and like that of negative controls. However, that does not mean that the body did not recognize this as a threat or ignored it. Because if, if you look now on the right side of the slide and look at some of the inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-6, IL-1RA, and chemokines, so many of them shown there, uh, you find that in almost every single case, um, there has been an increased production of inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, showing that the body is, is looking at it as an inflammatory threat, but still not doing anything about the virus itself. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry. So um, this paper came out from the group of uh, Hajja et al. And they uh, looked at uh, whether the type 1 interferon alpha resp responses were impaired with respect to disease status. So if you look at um, panel B, we are looking at uh, interferon stimulated genes. So as interferon alpha is produced by one infected cell and gets secreted from that cell and goes to neighboring cells, binds to the receptor, a JAK-STAT pathway ensues and activating a number of genes by a group, they are called interferon stimulated genes. And you find that in, in uh, if we still focus on panel B, uh, the first bar, black bar is healthy control. So obviously you do not expect ISG score to be high there, interferon stimulated gene score to be high there. But when you look at uh, mild to moderate disease, to severe disease, to critical disease, actually the ISG score surprisingly seems to seems to go down you would have you would have wanted it to remain high but you find that patients who became moderate and severe actually had poor isg scores if you actually look at levels of interferon alpha produced themselves again the same pattern panel c as disease progresses i mean as you look at patients who have progressed into severe disease or moderate disease they have lesser interferon alpha production compared to the milder patients and all of these scales, uh, I mean, at least the panel C is a log scale, so those differences are very meaningful. Still another important piece of information came out of the group of uh, uh, Paul Bastard et al. Um, and what they looked at was um, a number of severe disease patients, 987 patients with life-threatening COVID-19 pneumonia, 663 patients with uh, asymptomatic or mild disease, and also a large group, 1,227 healthy controls. They took their sera sample and tested for the presence of autoreactive antibodies, especially neutralizing antibodies against type 1, interferon, uh, type 1 interferons. <clears throat> this slide, if you look at the bottom panel now, uh, on to the left, uh, the y-axis is fluorescence intensity, which is representative of uh, amount of autoreactive antibodies present in the patient. Uh, the higher the value, the higher the amount of autoreactive antibodies. Uh, if you look at those patients that had life-threatening COVID-19 disease, uh, they many of them had autoreactive antibodies to not only interferon alpha, the red dots, but also interferon omega blue dots showing that in general autoreactive antibodies existed in those patients who progressed to life-threatening COVID disease. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, and of course, asymptomatic individuals did not have autoreactive antibodies, healthy uh, controls also did not have as much as uh, the, the advanced life-threatening patients had. These um, antibodies were, uh, so sera samples were tested and found to be neutralizing in nature so that when you try to infect cells with a virus, uh, COVID-19 virus, and then do that in the presence of varying amounts of the plasma from these 
um, severe COVID disease patients, you find that ISG scores or induction of um, STAT1 in this case seems to go down dramatically as the serum concentration increases. So it shows a correlation again in another way that, that there, there are patients who either do not express interferon alpha sufficiently, or type 1 interferon sufficiently, or unfortunately happen to have autoreactive antibodies to um, type 1 interferons. And, and all of those, those two types of patients are the ones actually that progress to more moderate and severe disease. These authors actually went back to the freezer and looked at the first sample also, uh, which was taken at the time of entry of patient into the hospital and found that those patients who had high antibodies against uh, interferon alpha later in the disease actually were carrying these antibodies right from the beginning. Uh, we all know that antibody responses take around two weeks at least to show up IgG antibody responses. So when a patient had just entered the hospital and was probably seven days into the disease, there was no reason for him or her to have uh, antibodies. So these antibodies existed in those subjects naturally. And it was those unfortunate subjects that ended up uh, becoming severe in, in this group of patients studied by Paul Bastard et al. Uh, st still another paper now, uh, what is the the impact of the uh, clinical treatment of these patients uh, with interferon alpha? So this paper came out of Wang et al's group and looked at uh, retrospectively uh, patients from Wuhan, 446 in all, out of which 242 patients happened to have been given type 1 interferons. Now we all know that China was the first to suffer from COVID. So obviously they were the first to try many things and type 1 interferons, interferon alpha 2b more specifically was one of the drugs that they had tested. Interestingly, what they found was that in retrospective analysis, those patients who happened to get interferon alpha early in the therapy had reduced mortality and also showed better responses than those patients who were given lopinavir or ritonavir. Another paper uh, coming out of the group of Lou et al happened to show an interesting phenomenon, which we will show uh, my colleague, Dr. Kevin Consagra will show from our own clinical trial, a, a, a reproduction of findings uh, of the study that came out of Lou et al. Now Lou et al also did a retrospective analysis only of their patients and found that those patients who were on glucocorticoids and also happened to get interferon alpha therapy actually benefited the, the, the most um, in comparison to others. So this combination of glucocorticoids with interferon alpha therapy giving a benefit and resulting into earlier hospital discharge, earlier symptomatic relief um, was postulated by, by these scientists in, in the following manner, uh, glucocorticoids, as we all know, are anti-inflammatory and they are reported to actually suppress the, the um, uh, inter type 1 interferon alpha production. And, and when you um, are giving patients glucocorticoids maybe earlier into the therapy than they should be, they would naturally stop producing any more interferon alpha. And when you supplement that interferon alpha also, you get uh, the antiviral effect along with the anti-inflammatory effect resulting into better outcomes. <clears throat> Still another paper, <clears throat> Wang et al, uh, comparing a smaller group of patients, 22 patients who were given lepinavir uh, uh, alone and 19 who were given LPVR in combination with interferon alpha. And it was clear if you compare red bar with the blue bar and the y-axis is the length of hospitalization in, in terms of number of days, that those who got LPVR only had to stay in the hospital longer than those who got LPVR along with uh, interferon alpha 2b. And within the interferon alpha 2b group, although the sample size was small, they could also dissect 
subjects into those who got early treatment with interferon alpha and those who got later treatment with interferon alpha. And it is beautifully clear as any scientist who's postulate interferon alpha interferons which are supposed to be the first line of defense would work the most only when they are given early in the disease green bar shows that effect very strongly <clears throat> uh, now i now um, bring you to our own in vitro data and then in vivo human data that dr kevin consagra will be presenting but here you can see uh, in the in the blue panel on the left the um, IC50, EC50 values of antiviral effects of various molecules that have been tested uh, in viral infections and, and a few of which have been tested in COVID also. So as you can see, uh, remdesivir is more potent than favipiravir and PEG interferon alpha is, is more potent than, than anybody out there simply because you go from micro, micromoles to femitomoles. So almost a million times, at least a hundred thousand times more potent PEG interferon alpha 2b is compared to remdesivir. And interestingly, the remdesivir IC50 value you are unable to reach in the blood with the recommended doses of remdesivir because that would end up being toxic to the patient. Whereas PEG interferon alpha 2b at that point, 3 nanogram per ml IC50 you are very easily able to achieve in, in, in human uh, patients. So, for example, if you now focus your attention to the orange box at the bottom, healthy volunteers, which were given one microgram per kilogram dose, ended up having a Cmax value of 0.65 nanogram per ml, which was already twice the amount uh, of 0.3, more than twice the amount of 0.3 uh, nanogram per ml, which was effective in terms of IC50. So, uh, with, with these bits of knowledge, some of which came out before we started the trial and some during our conduct of phase two and phase three, um, we will now look at how our molecule ended up behaving in clinical trials. And I would request my colleague, Dr. Kevin Consagra, to take over from here. I will run the slides for you, Kevin. Just let me know when to move them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Sanjeev, for your innovation and uh, showing up so the science beyond the given the interferon. So now I would like to request uh, Dr. Kevin for Dr. Kevin is a general manager in clinical research and the development of the Zyder Research Center Medical Leeds clinical research project to development of MCE and BE and bio similar. He has uh, many experience while using the Brabin. So we would like to request Dr. Kevin Kensakara for showing the us for the practical implementation of the priority. Dr. Kevin, please. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ko. So yes, uh, uh, in the background, uh, I think Dr. Talwar and Dr. Sanjeev has made my job more easier because uh, they have given a proper background of the COVID-19 as well as the role of the interferon in the COVID. So in this background, uh, uh, before the initiation of the phase two study, we have a, okay. uh, before initiation of the phase two study, we have a healthy volunteers data of the one microgram per kg dose. And uh, at the time in the last slide, you have seen the CMAX as well as the AUC uh, comparison with the in vitro data. So we are matching with uh, proper efficacy with the interferon alpha 2b is a pegylated one. And on that background, we have initiated the study, the phase two. And in this phase two study, we have a dose of uh, one microgram per kg. And uh, we had also in the provision in the protocol to use a second dose, but there is no requirement of the second dose. In the study, this is a proof of concept study. So we have started with uh, 40 participants. And the 20 participants uh, has given the PEG IFN and the standard of care and another 20 has received only standard of care. In the enrollment point of view, uh, we have just focused on the moderate subjects and our primary objective was, uh, if you see uh, the blue one, the third and the fourth point, the hospital
question those subjects are participate into the study and we have put uh, the improvement and the subject is not hospitalized and there is no limitation of the activity so there is a change into the seven point ordinal scale of the who those will be considered as the primary objective and in other secondary objective we have a qualitative rt pcr as well as the occurrence of the supplemental oxygen mechanical ventilation duration of the hospitalization safety and the tolerability uh, the uh, pathological all the kind of the hematology biochemistry markers are there and as well as the biomarkers because first time we are using this into the covid subjects so we have a thorough biomarker evaluation of the crp interleukin 6 d dimer interferon gamma ferritin tnf alpha as well as the interleukin 1 beta and the different days like on the baseline day 3 day 7 day 10 as well as in day 14. Uh, we have a demographic uh, the male and female subjects uh, were part of the study and in this study the subjects with the hypertension diabetic mellitus as well as the asthma subjects are there here the sample size on lower side so we have a small number of the comorbid condition is there but in our phase three study we have enough number of the subjects who have a comorbid condition and they were part of the study so now if you see the primary objective the improvement into the who ordinal scale and if you see the yellow box, the test uh, group, we have 20 subjects and out of these 19 subjects as an improvement in the WH ordinal scale, the percentage is 95%. And if you see the reference group, uh, 13 subjects has improved out of 19 subjects. So that is 68.42. So that value is uh, significant. So compared to the only standard of care group, if you are adding the PEG interferon alpha to be uh, in the standard of care, there is a definitely significant level is there in the WHO ordinal scale. And uh, now afterwards, uh, we this particular product is an antiviral product. So we have uh, different days for the evaluation of the RT-PCR. And if you see on day seven on the test group, we have 80% uh, of the subjects, those are negative with RT-PCR. And the reference group, that number is 63%. But now you see on day 14, the 95% of the subjects are the RT-PCR negative and the 68% of the subjects are the negative into the reference arm. So definitely on the test group, uh, we have a higher number of the responders are there. And uh, if you see the scatter plot of the oxygen requirement, uh, the red one is the PEG IFN plus the SOC and this blue one that is only SOC. And if you check the scatter plot, there are onto the lower side, there is a less requirement of the oxygen compared to the only standard of care arm. And the similar kind of the results we have also produced in our phase three trial. And uh, this is a, a small sample size, but in phase three, we have a higher sample size and we have a similar kind of the findings are there. Uh, the biomarkers, because uh, sometimes the KOs are thinking, okay, maybe if you are giving the pegylator interferon, maybe there is a chances of the cytokine storm. So we have a thorough evaluation of the, all the biomarkers in this phase two. And if you see on day three, day seven, day 10, day 14, as well as day 29, uh, there was no significant difference observed between the treatment groups of these biomarkers during the study. If we compare with the standard of care arm, and if you put a conclusion uh, on the basis of uh, the safety point of view, the no clinically relevant any kind of the significant finding on the basis of the vital science ECG and the overall the single dose of the pegylator interferon alpha 2b was safe and the well tolerated. Not a single subject uh, has uh, any of the adverse event that may be due to the interferon alpha 2b. And on that background, uh, we have initiated the uh, study with the large sample size of the 250 subjects and across the India. And in this study, we have total samples is 250, one is to one randomization. And uh, if you see the standard of care group, we have 125 subjects. And uh, in the standard of care plus the pegylator interferon alpha 2b, the another 125 subjects are there. In this group, uh, we have a uh, doses one microgram per kg. That is, uh, we are using subcutaneously. And uh, we have targeted the population of the subjects uh, with the moderate COVID-19. And we have a housing till day seven. 
and it may change depends upon the clinical condition of the subjects and sometimes the regulatory guideline as well as the current hospital practice and here we have a primary uh, objective was two point improvement into the ordinal scale on day 11 plus or minus one day and uh, we have put this seven scale as per the who and the secondary objective we have a different days uh, like day 8 day 11 and day 15 for the improvement in the who ordinal scale as well as the subjects who are the rt pcr negative the requirement of the supplemental oxygen mechanical ventilation duration of the hospitalization days here we have had the new endpoint like time to resolution of the clinical signs and symptoms the incidence of the adverse event as well as the serious adverse event and uh, other kind of the change in the WBC count as well as the biomarkers. Uh, inclusion criteria of the study, uh, we have uh, preferred the guideline of the family and the health and welfare of the India. And in that guideline, the moderate subjects they have defined, like uh, the subjects is a respiratory rate is more than or equal to 24 breaths per minute, or the SpO2 is uh, in between 90 to 94%. Uh, otherwise, the subject should be uh, RT-PCR positive as well as the radiographical infiltration is there. And uh, exclusion criteria, we have excluded the subjects of the ALT and ST more than five times, the stage four kidney disease, pregnant and the breastfeeding female, the severe comorbidity like uh, uncontrolled hypertension as well as the diabetic mellitus. Uh, in India, uh, uh, we have a recommendation to use of the hydroxychloroquine. So we had a baseline ECG to uh, the subjects who have a higher QT interval, those subjects were also excluded from the study. And uh, this is a schedule of assessment. We have a screening window is uh, five days. Then we have a check-in and the dose out, uh, check-out is on day seven. And then we have a safety follow-up till day 29. Now, if you go to the result, uh, before going to the result, if you see the subject disposition, so we have 120 subjects into the test arm and 130 subjects into the reference arm. Number of subjects discontinued from the study in the both arms remains uh, similar. There was no any uh, mortality that is due to the PEG-IFN. And couple of subjects are also lost to follow up as well as, well as the withdrawal uh, subjects by the study. But uh, in this study, we have put a higher sample size considering the dropout so we have uh, achieved a good power of the study to evaluate the primary objective as well as the secondary objective. As I have mentioned earlier, we have a higher number of the subjects with the comorbidity like the type 2 diabetic mellitus we have 59 and the hypertension subjects are also 58. And if you see the demographic characteristic of the age, gender, weight, height and the BMI, we have an equal distribution of the subjects in both the groups. And if you see the p-value, that is non significant. So the equal distribution of the subjects are there in the test as well as under the reference group. And the common treatment that was prescribed during the study, uh, that was hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, steroids, vitamins, anticoagulants, and the antiviral therapy that is as per the investigator discretion. Because in this phase three trial, uh, we in India we got a approval of the remdesivir for the emergency use. So some of the investigator prefer to use the remdesivir, and some of the investigator do not prefer to have a remdesivir. And the favipiravir is uh, not given uh, to the subject. So in our analysis, uh, first we have analyzed as per the protocol, uh, like uh, all the subjects together. And uh, then we have a subgroup of the population. They have received the steroid and some group of the population, they have also received the remdesivir. So we also did a subgroup analysis of the subjects, okay, how the peg IFN will behave with and without steroid as well as with and without remdesivir. So those slides I have also captured uh, in this presentation. And first, uh, as we know, uh, we have a viral phase in the initial uh, COVID-19. So on day 11, uh, if you see the two point improvement, so there is no difference between the test and reference. So within day 11, all the subjects are improved. So around 91% in test arm and the 92% into the reference arm. But the theory of uh, the antiviral therapy is early the therapy that is the better. So this uh, uh, particular pega and alpha 2B, we have already put a POC study. The drug has an antiviral activity 
and as well as the two point improvement uh, if you are giving the uh, pega fn early as well as the two point improvement improved uh, on the day 8 and if you see on the day 8 uh, the value of the test sum the 80% subjects are the responders here and the 68% subjects are responded into the reference sum so that value is uh, significant and then we go to the, this is a bar diagram, so similar values are there. And uh, now if you go to the RT-PCR, as uh, I have mentioned earlier, uh, the antiviral activity of the PEG-IFN, the early the therapy, the early the RT-PCR negative. So on day seven, if you see the 91% of the subjects are negative with the test term, uh, and the 78% of the subjects are negative onto the reference term. So the p-value is highly significant, the value is 0.01. And uh, then we also did analysis of the supplemental oxygen. And if you see the duration of the supplemental oxygen, the 56 hour requirement into the test arm versus the 84 hours requirement into the reference arm. And the signs and symptoms, the five days are there into the test arm and the six days are there into the reference arm. And the safety perspective, uh, the drug is safe. There was not a particular adverse event that is related to the PEG-IFN and we cannot see the any of the adverse event in the system uh, system organ class. But the higher number of adverse events are there into the test term and the lower adverse events are there into the reference arm. So the adverse events are equally distributed in both the arms. So there was no any safety concern uh, uh, in this all the subjects. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have additional analysis. So here, uh, the first table that I have already uh, narrated, uh, all the subjects together, we have a highly significant value on day eight. But now then the left one table on the lower side, we have divided into the subjects who have received the remdesivir and the right one, the subjects who have not received the remdesivir. The subjects without the remdesivir, the value is highly, highly significant like 0.006. 86% versus 68%. So yes, uh, if the some of the investigator, they are not prefer to use the remdesivir, still the PEG-IFN has a good role for the seven point improvement into WHO scale. And uh, similar way, day 11 and day 15, there is no change between test and reference part. And if you consider uh, the SOC plus remdesivir, there is no change on day 11, day 15, as well as on day, fifth, uh, day 15. And uh, now uh, we have a value of the negative RT-PCR. Now if you check uh, without remdesivir, the 93% of the subject has RT-PCR negative uh, on day 7. And the 76% of the subjects who are the RT-PCR negative uh, with the only SOC arm without remdesivir. So the value is also highly significant. So without remdesivir, yes, uh, the PEG-IFN has an antiviral activity. And uh, if you see the RT-PCR result uh, without, uh, uh, with remdesivir SOC, uh, although the sample size is on lower side, like 28 and 27, so the value is non-significant on day 7, day 11, as well as on day 15. And uh, then, uh, as Sanjeev sir has mentioned, the role of the steroid uh, in the COVID-19. And if you are adding the PEG-IFN uh, with steroid, okay, what will happen to the endpoints? So here, uh, the first table, we have all the subjects together. And the lower one, uh, the left side, if you see the steroids, like the PEG-IFN plus standard of care, we have used the steroid in 71 subjects. And the reference group, we have 74 subjects. The 85% of the subjects, we have an improvement onto the two point ordinal scale, as well as uh, in the reference group, there is an improvement in the 67% of subjects. So the value is highly significant, 0.009. And without steroid uh, here, there is no change between the test and the reference sum. Uh, maybe that is due to the less number of the sample size. But if you are using with steroid, yes, uh, there is a, a good improvement into the subjects. And uh, similar way, we have RT-PCR value on day seven. So the, there is no change into the antiviral activity of the PEG-IFN if you are using with steroid. So 95% of subjects improved uh, into the test term and the 73% of subjects improved into the reference term. The value is 0 0.0002. So that value is highly significant. And the duration of the supplemental oxygen uh, without remdesivir, yes, 
the value is significant like 56 hours versus 84 hours the p value is less than 0 0.001 uh, then we have uh, uh, subjects uh, who have a standard of care with remdesivir. Uh, there was no uh, change in the test and the reference sum, although the sample size is only 4 and 7. And uh, the SOC without steroid, the supplemental oxygen, there is no change between the test and the reference sum. And if you see with steroid, uh, the 56 hour, the duration of the supplemental oxygen required with the test term and the 84 hours with the reference term, the value is significant with the test term. And uh, then we have a clinical signs and symptoms. So without uh, remdesivir, the 87 subjects are there into the test term and 89 subjects are there into the reference term. But if you see the median range, five days versus six days, so there is a definitely a significant uh, improvement into the test term. And without uh, with remdesivir, uh, there is no change. And if you see SOC without steroid, uh, the sample size is 44 and 42. The median uh, improvement of the signs and symptoms in mean five days in both the groups. And if you see SOC with steroid, uh, the median value remains five days for the test term and the six days for the reference term. So that is uh, highly significant. And uh, considering uh, the data, as, uh, uh, as we have discussed earlier, this uh, product is already available uh, in India since 2011. And we have uh, more than 2,900 patient years data. They are very safe and efficacious in the chronic hepatitis B and C infection. And if you see the uh, result of the COVID-19, the higher proportion of the patients in the PEG IFN were showing two point improvement on day eight. The p-value is 0 0.03. The RTPCR pcr negative by day seven, the higher proportion of the patients are there with the PEG IFN arm. The p-value is 0 0.01. The hours of the supplemental oxygen required was significantly less in the PEG IFN compared to the reference arm. The p-value is less than 0 0.0001. Resolution of the signs and symptoms are also there. The five days is there in the PEG IFN and six days are there into the reference arm. So that is also significant. Uh, there was no any cytokine storm. Uh, there was no clinically significant changes into the laboratory uh, markers. So on that basis, this particular product, the PEG IFN alpha 2B is safe and very well tolerated. And uh, we have got an additional indication the treatment of the moderate COVID-19 infection in the adults uh, from our DCGI. Uh, in the initial part, uh, we have also tried to take an indication to the mild subjects. But as you know, uh, the subjects, the SpO2 level is uh, changing. It's not remain onto the similar uh, way because within one hour or two hour, the, so maybe the subjects are, are into the mild to moderate into the category. And the subjects with the moderate category, we have a very good uh, improvement in the RT-PCR, in the two-point WHO ordinal scale, the requirement of the supplemental oxygen, resolution of the signs and symptom, and there was no any safety concern. So on that basis, uh, I just uh, conclude my talk uh, onto the clinical perspective. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kevin, because your findings are very, very you know interesting for us. So you mean, uh, according to your finding, paraffin can be given in the moderate patients at home because there is a single short ingestion subcutaneously. So it will be a lot, a lot better for the, all the healthcare provider who are treating patients at home because there is a single ingestion and the only SC ingestion is no need for intravenous therapy. So that will be very good. So. Thank you so much and for you are all the experimental finding. And because of experimental finding, we would like to hear from the real world evidence. I mean the real world experience by the, the data who are using the that paraffin. So in that case, I would like to uh, request and uh, invite Dr. Nitin Akrawal. He is a consultant physician Cardiologist and cardiologist and managing driver at Hospital Pajawa, India. 
Now that meeting, thank you for joining us. And uh, we would like to hear your experience about the uh, using the paraffin for us. Thank you, Dr. Finn, please. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Some of my slides, uh, since three months I'm using Virafin, since the launch of Virafin in uh, Karnataka. And uh, I'm practicing at uh, uh, Bijapur, Karnataka district place. And uh, we have uh, treated uh, around 25 cases. So which I'll be putting in uh, just few slides. And uh, absolutely, uh, as Dr. Kevin has already elaborated uh, uh, about the uh, interferon, regulated interferon alpha 2b, we can see that uh, at our place in Bijapur, we used, uh, we have a 60 bedded hospital, and during the first wave of COVID, we treated almost around 1,000 uh, patients of COVID. During the second wave, we also treated around 600 patients. And we all know during the second wave, because of the change in the strain, we saw more mortality, more severe cases. And the same treatment protocol did not work in many of the cases compared to first wave. But we are very happy with the experience of using Virafin recently. and. Uh, the inclusion criteria at our center, we used uh, Virafin in 25 patients with uh, pneumonia uh, diagnosed confirmed COVID-19. And all the patients were adults more than 16, 18 years of age. They were all confirmed RT-PCR positive cases and the presentation or onset of symptoms was less than 10 days we selected. Uh, it's very easy, simple things. Whatever I'm giving my experience, the slides also are showing same thing. So can I just... Uh, no put this orally yeah sure so out of these 25 patients all were adults whom we treated at our center the ct score was around 6 to 16 and their uh, presentation oxygen saturation they all had hypoxia mild uh, around 90 to 94 percent of oxygen saturation they had and all were confirmed rt pcr positive cases we used uh, in 15 moderate and 10 mild cases and those uh, having comorbidities there were around 16 patients who were having comorbidities uh, they had diabetes hypertension and one patient had a cardiac ailment and uh, if you see the outcome part almost 24 patients improved uh, except that cardiac patient whom probably we selected uh, uh, because he had multiple cardiac ailments like he also had IHD and RHD both and uh, he had undergone CABG and uh, even though ejection fraction was good but uh, he died because of his cardiac ailment and uh, among these 25 patients 17 were inpatients and 8 were treated on OPD or daycare basis that is a plus point what I would like to highlight uh, so absolutely, uh, even though they had mild hypoxia, CT score was more than six. Uh, we took a chance and gave injection and uh, more, we monitored for four hours in our daycare center uh, for the vitals or any side effects. But they did well. These eight patients were treated on daycare basis with four hours observation. And um, uh, they hardly had, uh, you know, out of 25, five patients had mild headache. Uh, apart from that, we did not find any uh, other serious side effects. Only one or two patients had some nausea. And uh, for the headache, we just gave good hydration and the headache relieved for these five patients. And the patient's blood reports were monitored and CRP levels decreased so quickly. Uh, we treated, uh, as I said, almost around 1,600 patients in these two waves. And uh, seeing those uh, uh, follow-up, the CRP levels and other symptoms, they improved so quickly with Virafin. Uh, moment, I can we cannot see, we cannot hear the Dr. Nitim. Probably mute or is the internet connection is something wrong? Yeah, I think his internet connection would be an issue. I think he's not able to. Okay. So I'll. Uh, 
Uh, with the permission of the chair, uh, may we proceed for the polling? Yes, you can. Please do the poll at the moment. Why waiting again? You're done again. Thank you. So all, uh, all the participants will please participate in the poll. We have a poll for the the, the use of in the in the front uh, So please participate in the poll, please. Thank you, Professor Koko. So I will request the administrator to please start the polling. Uh, the audience, please note that you will have 10 to 15 seconds to answer each question. Thank you very much. All right. So I will request the chair, Professor Koko, to uh, begin the Q&A session. All right. OK. Thank you. So when we look in at the questions, uh, we can see a lot of questions. Uh, you can see what are the expected side effects if a patient is accidentally given a higher dose of regulated interferon alpha to be. Okay. So uh, in this survey study, we have used uh, one microgram per kg dose. And as per the package insert, the dose of the AIF and alpha 2B in chronic hepatitis B and C, that is on higher side. That is one microgram per kg, and that we are giving every week. So somehow, accidentally, if you are giving the higher dose of the PEGAF, I don't uh, think there will be any kind of uh, the severe or the serious side effects. Right. Thank you. So as you are being answered, another question, another question is, how should regulated interferon be injected? What is the dose? Uh, it's the injections. Uh, we are giving subcutaneous injection. One microgram per kg dose that is given by the injection with the 26 gauge needle, the subcutaneously. Thank you, talking. Thank you. Another question is, uh, Dr. Kevin, what would be the ideal to administer paraffin? after the onset of symptoms so yes uh, so normally the antiviral therapy earlier is better to prevent the progression of the disease so yeah. if you give the therapy early so the patient we can prevent uh, the viral replication and as we know the rt pcr value we have a very good result with the antiviral activity of the drug and we have a similar profile in phase two as well as phase three so the early the therapy that is the better okay so you mean sir early the one is a better one right yeah so another one where we i think is going to the uh Kemeni side how can we get interferon in myanmar what's the cause is it more effective in without remdesivir group i think that is a question for mr ram yeah, so we, for the yeah, Dr. Kevin, is it more effective in without remdesivir group? So I think so you already given the, so they, they can repeat the question, right? Right. So, but but we may tell because the same process perspective, we may not conclude key if without remdesivir or the with remdesivir that is more effective. But yes, we have a data of the without remdesivir and without remdesivir, there is no change in the efficacy. Right. Thank you. So we can use, I think, uh, Dr. Deepak Talwar is back. So we can use his expertise in answering some of the questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, over to you, uh, Prof. You're, you're mute, sir. Your mic is mute. Yeah. I'm sorry we lost you. And there are a lot of questions coming up to you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. One question is, uh, which one do you prefer? Is it uh, ivermectin or is it uh, favibrava in my cases? Can you hear me? Which, which one? <laughs> yeah, intermittently. I can't hear. Which one do you prefer? Is it I was making or is it uh, Ravi Brava in mild cases? Ravi Brava in mild cases. Thank you. Another question is 
can you use ivermedin for a prophylaxis for the hcp people so there are uh, studies from peru which shows that uh, it was effective when it was given post exposure prophylaxis and prophylaxis up to two months so we used it but then the question is how long for the healthcare workers to use it because this will be indefinite so that's the reason now it is the post exposure prophylaxis without exposure it is becoming too long and uh, it cannot be sustained for that so that's why it's only for a immediate post exposure and it's more more uh, more used by the family members thank you and so another one is in covid 19 confirmed case do you prefer remdesivir or favipirava or ivermectin or pegliflozin in the front is this in moderate in moderate covid the enomation just the confirmed case in covid 19 confirmed case do you prefer which one which antiviral agent remdy or pavi or ivermectin or pegliflozin in the front you cannot that that, that question did not mention it depends upon the severity of the disease and where we have choice and we will use remdesivir but if the patient is not in the hospital and then we have to use either fenipiravir or pegliflozin in front thank you so much thank you thank you and then uh, and any do did another one is do you did the patient who were prescribed on vasilitinib show increased incidence of thrombosis vasilitinib is said to increase the risk of rd thrombosis vasilitinib with the thrombosis not in particular because they are all on anticoagulants yeah so i said not in particular because uh, all of them are on anticoagulants but uh, thrombosis in the pulmonary circulation is being observed and uh, that is a routine if the patient remains hypoxic after 14 days we do angiography to look for pulmonary artery emboli thank you so much another one is what But is not embyxemia yeah what is the best time for giving the bacilitinib in the early phase or any phase or this is the question what is the best time to give bacilitinib so it is being used at the moment in in the moderate covid as soon as the treatment started is with steroids or with remdesivir with the remdesivir thank you so much another question is do you do you suggest to give alternation for liver transplant patient vaccination for liver transplant patient and which type of vaccination yeah, we are recommending uh, recommend vaccine so now the data is there for the organ transplant patient that uh, all of them can be vaccinated either with pfizer moderna or uh, the oxford vaccine only thing is that even after the two dosages they may not have sufficient antibodies so in that case uh, we are now looking forward for a booster vaccine for them if they don't have a neutralizing antibodies Thank you. One thing is any side effect of thrombocytopenia or anemia after varafin? I have not uh, used varafin personally in large number of patients so won't be able to comment. I think the anybody from the team varafin will be able to answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take that question? Yes. Any so, any Yeah, in our study yeah. we had analysis of the hematology uh, parameters. There was no any trend with the pegafin. Thank you. I think sir, I almost cover the most of the questions. So thank you so much to the other speakers for sharing your time. Thank you. 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 Let me now take the opportunity to invite Dr. Saw Nainwe, Deputy Managing Director of Pacific AA, who are our partners uh, in the distribution of Virafin. Dr. Sir, uh, Dr. Saw, name way, please. 
Doctor, Doctor, so you are on mute. Please kindly unmute yourself. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very honored and delightful to be here with you today, our honorable speaker, Professor Angus. I'm very honored and delightful to be here with you today. We a Medical Product Limited really proud to this uh, Varafin for the people of Myanmar together with the Swedish Kadila. Uh, Varafin will arrive in Myanmar tomorrow with the flight. And it is a great opportunity for the medical profession and the people. We are planning to sell with 100,000 checks per buyer, and I hope it is a very reasonable price and affordable price for our people. It is a cold chain product, and it is important to store at the 280 processes. And we are going to provide art and delivery and only to deliver 24 hours for the cities that we have offices. Thank you so much for your support. And we will try our best to serve the medical professionals and people of Myanmar. Thank you so much. Professor Coco, your mic is muted. Thank you, Dr. Saw. And we are very happy to hear that the uh, is coming tomorrow to the landing. And then uh, they say uh, you are selling with a very reasonable price. It's a one shock, just one shock for one leg. Yes, and uh, this is really reasonable price and very useful for the all the doctors who are treating the patient at home. So because uh, Ramdi Seva, as you know, we need the IV line and then we go for six six day and then we need a six buyer it costs a lot so even though the fabi brava is also a good one and they also is cost a lot as well so that will be very good news for us right thank you so much professor uh, with your permission now i'm back yeah there was some technical please, snack please do please do so uh, with your permission so uh, uh, presenting an intelligent uh, uh, solution uh, for COVID management from Zydus, uh, Virafin. And as you know, as Dr. Sanji was uh, making a mention in his uh, discussions that uh, COVID has got a trick of uh, making uh, the host not producing sufficient interferons. So type 1 interferon deficiency is a hallmark of severe COVID-19 and it may be avoided through early interferon administration. As you can see, and patient with efficient interferon production and activity the disease become mild to moderate while a patient with impaired interferon function uh, interferon production and uh, the patient tend to lead to uh, severe or medical COVID. and this is another slide you know which talk, talks about the scheme of possible severe COVID 19 phase uh, without and with early interferon therapy so so when we have seen that you know with patient with low interferon level the certain levels you know goes up and they get up uh, uh, some of them into severe disease and when early interferon therapy was administered and the we could get into only moderate disease and early recovery so as dr sanji was making a mention about the uh, potency of antivirals Virofin, as you can see, the AC50, IC50 is about only 0.3 nanograms per milliliter. And so this is almost 10 million times more potent than remdesivir. And Virofin achieves like with a standard recommended dose of 1 microgram per kilogram body weight. As you can see that, you know, significant levels are achieved. And not only that, with single shot Virofin, the drug levels are maintained for more than 200 hours, almost for seven days. So uh, th that's why you know the patient requires just a single shot. And this slide talks about very important slide. This talks about the timing of interferon. As Dr. Deepak Talwar was making a mention, is it about the drug or the timing? You know, it is both. So with interferon, when we start early. We can see that there is a reduction in the viral load, and when there is a delayed interferon, we can see that the uh, the viral load is very significant. And when 
there is an interferon deficiency you know the patient we can see that the viral load is very very high so early treatment with virafin will definitely ensure a significant reduction of the viral load so thereby facilitating an early recovery from the disease so this is a phase 3 trial you know which i quote from dr kevin so higher proportion of patient in virafin arm shown to improvement on day 8 versus reference arm and rt pcr was negative by day 7 and there is a reduction i mean over of supplemental oxygen required and time to resolution of sign and symptom was significantly less in virafin arm and i am coming to the most important slide uh, i think you know this is going to be very very practical because the dosage is 1 mcg per kilogram body weight per dose uh, along uh, along with recommended dosage and route of administration is subcutaneous and method of preparation is very important and at simple because in virafin you will have virafin lyophilized powder powder we are going to provide water for injection 1 ml and there is a 20 gauge needle there is a 26 gauge needle and there is a disposable syringe so uh sheshadri you can mute others i'm i'm getting echo so the first and foremost you know we have to draw points 7 ml uh, push into the vial uh, shake it mild shaking rolling drop away clear solution and take it into now a uh, uh, 26 large inch and administer as a subcutaneous injection so 0.5 ml equivalent to about 80 mcg is a dosage and storage recommendation is 2 degree to 8 degree and it should not be frozen and you can and this product comes with the other product information can talk so you can refer for further information and price you know we have kept like you know very reasonable as uh, as compared to other therapies which are available when we uh, compare it is very uh, reasonable it cost as dr sonuni said it cost about 1 lakh chat so uh, thank you very much and uh, request now professor koko to take over from my side but uh, with the time limit i would like to wrap up the or the uh, the symposium now i would like to close the symposium so uh, thanks to the all the speakers and the, first of all i would like to thanks to the dr deepak dawa for sharing the his experience and indian experience and that will be a lot a lot learned for us he is really talking about the in the viral phase don't give the desmazone he mentioned about all the viral viral drugs and then we can learn one new one this is a uh, interferon in spite of we are using fibrava uh, in remdesivir in our country we are now new one is coming up with the interferon this is a really amazing one and then he mentioned that the the desmazone is a really important and you can you can use the midiprat as well and he mentioned about tocilizumab and the paracetamol everything so thanks to the dr gibbak also dr sanjay kumar is a uh, talking about the science behind the giving the bravin for us so interferon deficiency is really important in the covid-19 so uh, why we using the interferon for that so thanks to the dr sanjay kumar as well and the dr kevin also talking about uh, all the experiment findings of the petlade in the front when we use the ali and without remdesivir with remdesivir steroid without steroid there were less side effect and then more more uh, bar clearance and then and more negative and the pcr in the 7 days so these are the thing, things that we have to learn so thanks to the other speaker and thank you to the mr ray and the zaidas team for bringing us a new weapon for fighting against the, uh, the covid-19 in myanmar as well thanks to all and then i would like to hand over to the dr hadi for continuation thank you thank you professor koko and uh, with that uh, we would like to uh, wrap up this symposium with a few words and vote of thanks from mr ram 
our country head for Zaydis Myanmar. Over to you, Ram sir. Thank you, Dr. Hadik. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Professor Koko. Uh, I must thank, like, you no know, Chair. You know, this was this symposium was arranged in a very short notice. I think you know this is the shortest symposium time you know we have uh, made within say about five days. You know, we could arrange the symposium and uh, organize it. So thank you very much for the Chair Professor Koko for your uh, guidance. And I must acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Deepak Talwar. Like you know, I've known him for more than 20 years. And suddenly I called him, sir. You no, know, this is what we want. We would like to hear uh, uh, your experience uh, about treating uh, COVID, Indian experience. And he was too glad immediately, you know, because you know, he's a very, very busy practitioner. And he immediately gave uh, the time for us. Uh, unfortunately, we could not. Uh, I think he has back. I think Dr. Uh, Talwar. Uh, uh, Dr. Talwar, you are back. Maybe, you know, after I post it, you know, I would uh, still we will use your uh, presence here to answer some of the questions which is uh, to be answered and i uh, thank uh, dr sanjeev uh, you know um, sbr torch bearer for the research center of uh, zrc uh, thank you very much sir uh, for your uh, uh, beautiful uh, presentation and uh, dr kevin thank you so much you know i think you know uh, the, the kind of work you know we have done uh, for virapin is uh, uh, it is cannot be explained in words because you know we have such kind of work you know we have seen only in multinational things you know the kind of uh, detailed work we have done is something amazing and it gives a lot of confidence to each one of us that you know this uh, birafin is one of the safest drug effective drug in the management of covid when it is going to be used uh, early so thank you so much and i also uh, thank uh, uh, our uh, partner uh, Dr. Sonuni, Deputy Managing Director for uh, Pacific AA. Thank you very much, Dr. So. And in fact, you know, uh, the drug will be available uh, landing tomorrow afternoon. And she has uh, uh, promised us, I mean, with all support that all possible help she will do to see that the drug is available at an earliest date, maybe uh, 19 or 20th, it should be available for uh, Myanmar. It will be available. And thank you, Dr. Hardik, for uh, uh, very good coordination and uh, your uh, uh, scientific inputs for conducting uh, this symposia uh, to this extent. Thank you so much. I also thank Shishadri, who's at the back end. You know, this is the platform you are using for the first time. Thank you, Sish, for, uh, for arranging this again. And I take this opportunity to thank our top management, senior management, uh, Sri Ganesh Naik, sir, is uh, our uh, the CEO and permanent director of uh, ZS. Uh, group and I take the opportunity to uh, thank our president uh, Dr. Amrut Nayak you know who is also present in this uh, symposia see he wanted to attend this symposia as uh, as an attendee he could have very well come as a, a speaker or a presenter he said I would like to be an attendee and uh, thank you so much sir for sparing your time and giving all kind of a support for making uh, Virapin available here in Myanmar in shortest time and I also personally thank uh, Mr. Manjul Mishra. He's our senior vice president uh, uh, for SB1 for all help in making Virafin available for uh, Myanmar. And I also thank, you know, Mr. Zumokain, you know, uh, I mean, he's the one who's really helped in coordination with, uh, you know, FDA. And I thank our uh, FDA and MOHS for, uh, you know, making this drug available in a very shortest time. And I uh, thank each one of you, the participant for an audience. You know, we, uh, we recorded more than about uh, uh, 400 participants in a busy day. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sparing your time. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, we come to an end of this symposium. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, all the speakers. And please stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.